Okay. <laughs> Are you ready? Let's do this. Okay, good afternoon everyone. My name is Michael Markowski. Welcome to my studio here in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Today we are going to recreate another painting by another one of my all-time top five favorite artists, I think of all time. For me personally, the artist we're gonna be looking at today, Diego Rivera, is the best of the best. And we talk, we today's our second of two episodes that uh, back to back that we're focusing on his work. And so we talked a lot more about his biography, particularly kind of some of um, uh, kind of his life in, in, in general, I guess, like from birth to you know, and a bit of his relationship with Frida Kahlo, which we'll get into more today. Um, today, what we're going to be doing is focusing on. A, a mural of his, or actually a detail of a very famous mural of his that is in uh, Mexico City. I've been there in person. I made a little pilgrimage to see it and a lot of his great work in Mexico City. Um, and I was not disappointed. It lives up to the billing. It is in a museum dedicated to this mural. And for good reason, well, well let's talk about all about, let's get the image up here. <laughs> Um, where are we here? Okay, so actually, you know what? Maybe let's just I'll show some of this. What I'm up to here. Come on. No, I want this. Come on, slow computer getting going here. Um, today, I've just given you a heads up right off the top. This is going to be a longer episode. This is going to be one that's going to go on for four hours or so, or or maybe more, um, just because there's a lot of detail in this painting. And I'm a huge fan of Diego Rivera's work, and this is our 130th episode. And while I've I've you know, all of the artists we're choosing are from, from my own personal self-interest, people that I've been in love with forever. This is an artist that I'm particularly more than almost any of them interested in. So I might take my time doing it and trying to do a really great version of it. Just like we did yesterday. Yesterday's painting wasn't an overly complex one, but I just took my time because I loved the painting. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to make this one. It's going to go on my wall somewhere. So... That's the way I'm going to approach today's painting as well. You're certainly welcome to skip right to the very end if you're watching this video after it was recorded and see what you think at the end. And if you want to um, follow along and go back to the beginning or skip ahead, because I know most people aren't going to watch the entire video from beginning to end. Uh, I probably wouldn't either. Um, but uh, you would sort of see how you'll see generally kind of the steps that I do if you kind of skip through. And of course, if you go right to the end, you'll see how it all turned out. So before we go too much further, I want to let you know that there's an outline for this particular painting. So which I've done, I use the uh, uh, Procreate app on my iPad Pro with the Apple Pencil. And I just bring the image in and then go over top of it with a line. I, one of the things though with this painting, however, is I have made some changes and we'll take a look at those changes in a moment. Uh, let's just, I'll show you where you can find the outline that, uh, that I have here. And uh, I've done, I've already done the transfer onto canvas. So I'll kind of speed through that pretty quickly. If you scroll down in the, there's a Dropbox link in the description below, you scroll down there, you'll see all of the other great artists that we've covered throughout the past year, because yesterday was the one year anniversary. I've been teaching these live stream painting classes online on YouTube here. So there's a lot of stuff. I'm not gonna go through it all. You could see them in there. There's some of the greatest artists of all time, Leonardo da Vinci, Picasso, uh, uh, Van Gogh, Diego Rivera's wife, and 
ex-wife and then wife again <laughs> is in there as well. Uh, there's also a whole 45 episode intro to painting course which I did and again that's in the, the description below so there's a couple playlists of videos. Anyway, you click on Diego Rivera, you're going to see a bunch of these files. Uh, the top, what is that, six or, or from yesterday's episode. There is also another painting, which I'm not going to do, this portrait of a young girl. But the three ones we're looking at are the, on the bottom three here. Basically, you have the JPEG of this, and here's another JPEG, and then you've got the PDF version of the outline. Maybe just while I'm, I'm on here... There's a private Facebook page just for people who are following along to these uh, episodes and who want to join this incredible community of artists who are painting along. Here's May's version of uh, Vincent Van Gogh's famous Potato Eaters. This is really Van Gogh's first masterpiece, and we did this painting about a month ago, maybe a couple month and a half ago or so, during our Van Vincent Van Gogh week. That was that was a great painting. Actually, I was just looking at it earlier today because um, I'm starting to photograph all of these and put them together. So here's yesterday's painting. Wow, look at that, Maria. That's great. And then Charmé posted this. Um, this anyway. There's there's lots of awesome <laughs> stuff here. Let's just take a quick look at Diego Rivera's biography for just a moment. As I said, yesterday's episode we went into maybe a little bit more depth. Today I'm going to sort of talk more about this specific artwork. And um, and his murals in general, because yesterday we were painting a, uh, that portrait of the young boy, Ignacio Sanchez. So he was. we talked about him painting on canvas. Now we'll talk a little more specifically about uh, Diego's mural career. Um, so born 1886, died 1957, age 70, uh, a long, super productive life, incredibly prolific artist. When you see the size of these murals, it is out. It's just the fact that he did one of them is outstanding. The fact that he did probably about a hundred of them throughout the course of his life, murals that are the size, you know, of sometimes five-story buildings on the outside. Now he didn't do them all by himself. He would often work with a crew of people helping them, but he certainly planned them all out. He would have probably touched almost every surface of the of the wall going back and kind of finishing details, etc., so that it was very clear that it, it was his hand that had finished everything. But a monumental achievement. This guy was basically a workaholic uh, and uh, certainly affected his personal relationships. He had four wives and, as I mentioned, kind of hinted there, Married um, Frida Kahlo here in 1929. They divorced a year or ten years later, and then they got div then they got remarried the year after they got divorced. And she uh, they stayed together I think until she died. Uh, I was a little confused yesterday about that, but I'm pretty sure that yeah. Anyway, um, so there was th that whole relationship, which we'll get into with uh, Frida Kahlo, was a tumultuous <laughs> relationship. At the very least, um, yeah, we talked all about his kind of early biography yesterday and, and his travels to uh, to Paris to study and the friends that he met in Montparnasse, which is a famous artist district in Paris, was formerly kind of a red light district, a really beautiful, neat neighborhood kind of on the on a hill and it's just a fun place to walk around. You kind of get a really neat view of, of Paris below if you've ever been to Paris. It's a great, I mean, Paris is a wonderful city. There's so much to do, but if you're looking for a, something to do for free, is walk around the Montreux-Panasse neighborhood and, you know, go sit at a coffee shop. Uh, anyway, so here's the painting we're gonna be looking at today. Now, here's an image that shows, this is kind of a panorama of it. This is gives you a little bit better idea. It's a it's a big painting, and basically all of the figures in this painting are roughly life size, maybe a little bit smaller than life size. And how does it is there a, does it say how big this mural is? Fifteen meters by by five meters, essentially, or fifty one feet by fifteen feet. <coughs> Right, so 51 
feet. That's that's about the size of two city buses side, you know, you know, if they were in traffic sitting one in front of the other. A big mural, big space. I don't know, actually, as I think about it, I don't know if he painted this one by himself or not. Again, he probably had a few assistants helping him. By the time he did this painting in 1946, 1947, he was undeniably a, a, one of the biggest art celebrities in the entire world. He was a hugely popular artist. I mean, by this point, I think in 1931, the Museum of Modern Art held his retrospective, right? So in the Museum of Modern Art, which even at that, you know, was sort of just getting started, uh, you know, 1931, I think Museum of Modern Art starts in maybe the 1920s or so, but so it wasn't, it was still a fledgling organization, but even then having a major exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art was a big deal, right? It's, it's you know, even you know, today, without question, having your retrospective at Museum Modern Art, it, you're, you've achieved the pinnacle of uh, art world recognition, critical recognition, and also popular recognition as well. So, this is he's making this painting 15 years after he's already summited the peak of art. So, he is uh, at, at his highest power. He dies only, what, is, what that would be about seven years later so he's also getting a little bit older you know he, he would be what about uh, 63 when he made this painting and a question I, I guess I would think is like how many of the giant murals did he make after this because mural painting is is a very physically exhausting task right we're gonna make this painting i'm standing on my feet but i've got some to kind of lean on when you're painting on a giant wall you're crawling up and down ladders up and down scaffolds you're you've got paints you're sometimes in the hot sun beating down on your neck and you're wearing a big you know it's and you're just dripping in sweat right it's just uh, it, you know in mexico city which is a hot place again i've been to mexico city i by the just as an aside, if you've never been to Mexico, it is one of the most awesome countries in the world. It's, it's probably my favorite country to, to travel to and visit. Uh, I've never been to a resort town in Mexico. I've always I've been to Mexico City. My wife and I went to Mexico City for our uh, honeymoon and to the kind of neighboring area of Oaxaca. The 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 most beautiful place, the 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 greatest people I've ever visited relatively inexpensive everyone is happy they were especially for canadians like they were just so overjoyed to see us um and uh uh yeah uh, uh, and also very safe i know there are some people like oh you're going on your honeymoon to mexico it's pretty dangerous and it's like clearly people who've never been to mexico um because there's yes there's dangerous parts of mexico but you could certainly find there's dangerous parts of Vancouver here, right? Um, that you wouldn't want to be walking around late at night with, uh, with as a tourist, right? So, if you're if you're smart about it, you're you'll stay very clear of all of the problems. Um, okay, so let's. Uh, I'm going to transition here to get this painting started because uh, it's going to take me a while. So let's get to it, right? So. As I mentioned, you can download the template, the outline that I've already done, and I've used some uh, carbon paper here. So I'm going to blow this. Uh, I'm going to replay this video. I'm just going to blow this up. I'm going <laughs> to enlarge this video, and I'm going to play it while we talk a little bit about this process. Um, so I'm just using. You can see carbon paper, some tape, and some colored pencils. And we're just going to put this generally right in the middle and then put some tape up top. And then I'm going to, I've, there's a lot of detail in this painting. So I am really quickly going over a lot of it because like, you know, these hands in here, you know, the stripes, you could see, I'm just sort of, you know, even these feathers, I'm like, yeah, I know, this is a lot of this is going to get obliterated when we, I'll just see, that's what it looks like. Oh, I just realized the feet didn't transfer properly because there was not enough carbon paper there. So, uh, anyway, let's 
move on from that. You get, get an idea of how this process works. I'll just draw, I didn't even finish that boot. Usually I'm, I'm pretty careful about looking at the drawing. So why don't I just finish that right now. All right, I can just go, oh, here's his shoe. Okay, and that's everything. Oh, even up here. So the obviously the, the I will talk. I'll show you. I have eliminated some of the details. Uh, I've also, in fact, it is worth just showing you if we look at this image here. So this is the central section of this entire mural. And I think there's another, if I scroll down here, so you can see how big this image is. And here's the central part. I've, I've eliminated, the. I basically cut the, this image out of the background. The, the person right next to this figure here was, is actually the, the illustrator who created this image, which has gone on to become like one of the most famous images of the um, of the Day of the Dead, which is uh, the uh, you know a very fa or important day in the the uh, Mexican Latin American calendar that happens right after Halloween. I think it, is it like November first? I think I can't remember if you'll somebody will let me know in the description below. Okay, so. Um, Let's uh, let's move on to this. Oh, I just, the reason why I eliminated some of the extra details is because the painting is going to take a while. Uh, I didn't want to have to do, you know, I didn't. I, I'm just not going to paint the entire mural, and to to focus on these figures, I also didn't want to cut people's faces in half. And what we see here, this is actually the ground front. I I took an image of the Alameda Park. Uh, where this image takes place, uh, the actual Alameda Park in Mexico City, and just sort of put it down here behind them. And these are some of the actual trees in the original Rivera painting. So I did a little bit of moving around of a few things, eliminating some things, just so we could focus on this image together here. So where should we begin here? Let's... Um, Now, as I think about this, oops, where did, oh, I must have closed this. Um, we talked last episode, when it comes to Rivera's paintings, the mural process is, is you put wet plaster onto a wall, or sorry, the fresco process, because frescoes is a kind of mural painting. Fresco painting is when you take wet plaster and you apply it to a wall or a floor or a ceiling. Uh, you could do this onto an object if you want. It could, you could do it onto a bottle or the only thing is the plaster may crack on some surfaces. But you take wet plaster, you mix it, you know, if you've broken your arm and you, you're my age, you remember what that, you know, those plaster bandages are like. And you 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 use a uh, like a trowel and you put it onto the wall and as it's drying you're painting on, into the wet plaster and then as that plaster dries it binds with the the pigment and you've got a really nice uh, it's it's got a very matte quality like opposite of glossy very matte kind of quality because the, the 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 plaster kind of soaks up the 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 paint in a particular way and. Um, it is also very stable. You know, the Sistine Chapel is a fresco that has been around for 500 plus years. And while there is some uh, conservation issues with it, it is held up pretty well. Right? And we talked last episode about Leonardo's La Last Supper. Did I say Last Supper? The, the Sistine Chapel was Michelangelo. The Last Supper is Leonardo. Leonardo was using experimental techniques in that. He painted that roughly around the same time. 
as the Sistine Chapel, the Last Supper was falling apart, flaking off the wall as Leonardo was painting it. So it gives you an idea of of different techniques have certainly uh, different archival properties. Uh, and the technique Michelangelo was using is roughly the same technique that Diego Rivera was using. So we have a pretty good idea that, that the murals that Rivera did should be with us for another 500 years. This painting, of course, was, was made about, what, 80 years ago? So hopefully it will last a lot longer than that. So I'm just going to put my labels here on my palette. And then I'll look at some of the comments. There's already a very active chat going on in there, which is great. Okay, so get that going. So the reason why I started talking about mural painting was traditionally fresco painting, you're painting onto a white surface. Uh, the plaster you could you can dye plaster you could put pigments directly into the plaster uh, but generally artists are painting right in, onto a white surface which is the same way that Diego would have painted this particular mural but I am still going to use my uh, kind my, this warm yellow that I've been using throughout the past hundred and plus episodes just because it's, I think it's just going to save me a little bit of time, and, it's, and I like the effect that it creates. If you're wondering about a, an alternative method that's probably much more common, at least historically, for for this process, like what we're doing right now is called the impramatura, which is the first layer, the, the under layer or wash on a canvas. The painting we did of Thomas Cole's Oxbow which we did just a few days ago, I did a version with the yellow, and then I also did one with a, a warm brown that I applied, a very small, just so people could see the difference. And the difference is so nominal, so small. There is a difference. It's not that there isn't a difference, but f especially for beginner artists, the difference is so minor that... Um, and it, and it takes an extra, you know, maybe two or three minutes to mix up that brown color in, unless you, you're squeezing it out of a tube, which, if you know me, I'm always recommending you mix your own browns and greens and purples and oranges and grays rather than use um, pre-made paint um, because you'll learn how the properties of painting better than you will if you just... Um, squeeze them out of a tube, even though, I mean, there's nothing to stop you from doing it. I'm not there in your studio looking over your shoulder, so it doesn't bother me. It's just that if you really want to learn how to paint, I suggest you, you learn how to paint, <laughs> And how to mix colors is really at the, the center of all painting. Okay, so nice kind of warm yellow. This is going to give this painting a nice glowing uh, effect, which is what I always, I just want from all my, well, almost all my paintings, I want them to have a warm glow. There's, there have been a few where we've used a cool blue and a warm or a cool red to get some kind of different effects. Um, but, you know, this painting is, is titled Sunday Afternoon in Alameda Park, or A Dream of... I thought it was a dream of a Sunday Afternoon in Alameda Park. Maybe I just named it shorter just so it would, it would fit. Maybe that, that was the... Um, so, I, I kind of feel like that warm color lends itself well to the idea of a dream. Okay... Um, oh, lots of, so lots of comments here. Lolly says, I don't know much about Rivera, so I'm looking forward to learning a little bit more about him today. You did a great job yesterday with Rivera's painting, by the way. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. 
Ace says, hi, Lolly, good to see you. I'm all right. Lolly says, I'm all ready. For Eleanor says, I'm watching today as I'm in the Maritimes right now. Oh, that's cool. Is it, it's pouring rain here in Vancouver. I wonder what it's like on the East Coast. Um, uh, Lolly says, happy Friday, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Shamza says, hello, Michael. How are you doing? I miss being in your classes. As, as Shamza, great to see you again. Shamza was in one of my classes at Emily Carr. Um, I hope you're having a great semester so far now that we've just begun in-person classes for the first time in, in a year and a half. Uh, Olga is there as well. Hi, Olga. Good to have some history of this artist. I didn't realize that Diego Rivera was so prolific. Uh, and I appreciate you sharing your wealth of knowledge. Cool, thank you. I, you know, it's for me, it's 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 fun talking a little bit about artists and their biographies because I think it makes the paintings that much more interesting. Um, as we get to know a little bit about who the artist was, and also some of the historical events and situations that uh, they found these artists found themselves in or they created in some instances, um, I think it makes the paintings that much more rich uh, because then we start, we can kind of understand some of the choices that they may have made in their painting process. So, um, while this is almost dry, I'm just gonna move it off to the side for a moment and, and get some paint on the palette. This is also not my usual day for painting, so I'm actually quite surprised to see so many people have tuned in on a Friday evening. Some of these Friday episodes have been really quiet, and I think we did one, was it last week? And it was like one of the busiest ones that I've done in ages. So I was like, oh, that's that's interesting. You never know. I, you know part of it has to do with the artists that I've chosen for, for particular days, and I totally get, you know, some uh, some of the more famous artists are obviously going going to attract more people. That's not surprising to me at all. Um, but I'm also surprised that some some uh, there's been a few more obscure artists. And when I look at the the um, the view counts, sometimes those are really high. So I, it might just be also because not just some people might not know who the artist is, but they're like, oh. That's a painting of a dog. I'll, I'll I'll make a painting of a dog, and then they're like, "Oh, this is really interesting." Learning about the about this artist. So, um, I've sort of given up <laughs> trying to uh, appeal to what I think everybody wants, and have just sort of, and I end up kind of painting what I want, which is I think what everybody should do, right? Uh, that is. Just as a little bit of a segue, one of the things that I learned, that the main thing that I, I took away from my whole art school experience when I was a student, was ultimately you have to think of yourself as the, as the first viewer or the audience for your work. If you're making artwork for other people in hopes of pleasing them, it's a fool's errand. You are just going to be very, very disappointed because um, the it's 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 impossible to, to satisfy everybody. And the the best way to do it is just think of like what would I want to see? What do I want to have on my walls? And um, if you're painting what you want, you will find other people that will also want it as well. Okay, uh, so let's... And it is interesting, actually, as I say that, you know, we're talking about Diego Rivera, who was a mural painter, and was making giant paintings on... Uh, not always outside, often out... Sometimes, actually, not... I'd say maybe maybe a third of them were outside. A lot of them were inside, inside like big atriums and um, uh, like concourse spaces. So um, 
he definitely was very interested in in connecting with the general public. So he did want uh, lots of people to see them, and he wanted lots of people to to like them and to be inspired by them. Um, but I think he he was also more than happy to like he at the same time also prioritized his own interests his own eccentric um interests in in like history and uh and current events he you know very he had a very specific lens that he looked at things through so even though he was trying to 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 attract the most amount of people i think the way that he did it is by really being very adamant that he was going to do whatever he wanted to do and express what he wanted to do and people find that very exciting and interesting right if you're saying if you take a position and you and you stand fast on it often that is very attractive to other people right because there's a lot of wishy-washy stuff out there in the world <laughs> anyway, i'm going <laughs> to mute my microphone i'm going to blow dry this just for a couple seconds and then we're going to start painting on it So, um, where was I, uh, wow, there's so, where, uh, oh, Olga says it's, uh, Saturday morning in Australia, it's a cloudy Saturday morning, wow, that's great, um, my sister lives out there in Sydney, Australia, and, you know, right now, we're, you guys are approaching summer, <laughs> I just, oh, I always find that so backwards in my mind you know trying to the anytime i try to do you know phone conversations with her with my sister uh think about the weather time of year all these things everything is sort of the exact opposite i mean they are literally on the opposite side of the world right um eleanor says it's sunny and 24 degrees in halifax today well i guess i can't complain about the weather in vancouver because Especially compared to Halifax, you guys should you guys will take it take the good weather while you get it because I know Halifax the sum the winters and that wind that comes through town woo, goes right through no matter how many layers of clothes you got it will chill you to the bone right okay so let's look at this painting how are we gonna start this one. Okay, well, the first thing I'll say off the top is I'm painting on a canvas that is 9 by 12 inches. It's this big. This painting, even if we were just to cut this out of the wall, would be somewhere around 8 feet high by 4 feet or something, right? So it would be literally taller and, you know, like a like a big wide doorway right so just keep that in mind as we're working on this painting that that literally we could probably fit maybe 40 canvases this size inside the original painting maybe maybe even more right so we are not going to be able to get all of the detail in here maybe some people if they really want to spend the time could do that and do like miniature ver miniature painting with tiny little brushes but i am going to radically simplify things including right off the top i'm going to work in the background and i want to get the background done as quickly as possible so there's going to be far fewer details like we see right over here there's all of this what looks at this scale like pointillism like lots of tiny little dots 
I'm not gonna do all of that. I'll probably just do flat colors back here. Um, I think, right? So let's get started right there. Let's let's start with this. Let's put some. So as I've talked about many times before, we want our cool colors in the background, and warm colors in the foreground. You could also put warm colors in the background, but if you do that, you're going to need to desaturate them, add some white or gray to that color to give it that sense of atmosphere. Um, so with this painting, it is quite saturated. You know, the colors are relatively saturated, so we want to have um, maybe less white in the background here. There is a, a lot of gray, a lot of tints in these colors tints and tones. A tone is when we add gray to a color, and a tint is when we add white to a color, and a shade is when you add black to a color. Just for a little bit of vocabulary there. So, um, let's start by mixing a cool green. I also ordered, by the way, uh, a bunch of new paint brushes. The same paint brushes I ordered before, um, from Amazon. The links are in the description below. I just felt like, you know what, it's been a year of painting. It's time to to get some new brushes. I'm actually surprised, though the ones that have held up the best are the Princeton brand of, um, and they're, again, this is in the description below. They're, you know, for 15 bucks, I still have them here on that I'm using, they're, they're starting to show their wear, which is why I ordered more of them, but uh, I'm, I'm quite surprised. So let's take, I'm taking a bit of white and I'm gonna mix it into this color. And this is, let's, if we look at the, the original here, let's put them side by side. Right now that color is maybe a little bit green let's get a bit more white in here. or it's a little bit too kind of winter fresh icy green all right let's get a bit more towards the lime kind of thing That's closer to what I want. So I think what I'll, I'm going to do, let's, um, I might even eliminate these leaves that they're up at the top here, just for the sake of convenience. And... Uh, we have all these purples in here, which are also really nice. So... Um, and you can see I'm painting right up to the... and over top of some pencil lines as well. I'm just going to leave a few kind of gaps and Now we can modify everything we do here. This is what we're doing is just working on the the underpainting, the first layer and just want to get this established.
that's probably good with this green for right now. Uh, so let's, I'm gonna move on to a slightly different, let's add maybe more yellow. Slightly different version of this. See, I'm I'm just I'm moving fast and playing it loose here. I mean, this is the kind of thing that I don't want to spend any mental energy thinking about, worrying about. I was even gonna go to purple next, but maybe I'll just leave this like this for now. same even though well maybe I'll, I will make a little bit of a cool purple back there that wasn't too bright because I just what what I what happened there is I started kind of painting wet paint into paint that was almost dry and when that happens you end up kind of lifting some of the original paint out of there. Um, okay, so let's make a purple, a cool purple. So I'm gonna take some warm blue and some cool red and mix these together. blue here so this is a kind of a neutral purple is a very unusual color so um, let's put is that too much white actually no that should be okay purple always sort of straddles a line between warm and cool in a way that many other colors don't so I'm just gonna I just needs even more Put it in a few places back here. I 
really what I'm just, I'm doing this almost kind of thinking a little bit aloud to myself of like, what would it look like if I did this here? Because there is a bit of purple in that background. Um, this allows me to kind of see just a, a little preview of what it could look like. And then if I want to carry this through later, then I'll, I'll do a little bit more of that. I'm honestly not even looking at the original while I'm doing this because the, the background that I've put in here is sort of is a, a collage of a bunch of backgrounds from the original so it's not even it's not like I'm like basically the, the image on the left there the background has been invented from me you know it's it's it does appear in the original but not in the way that it looks right here. Uh, oh, I forgot the ground down there, so I'm just going to put that in now. Let's just take that paint off. Here's this railing. Get that in a second. I'm just going to paint right over top of the vertical posts in this this is this is actually a very low railing if you've ever been to Alameda Park you know it's but the it, this kind of little railing comes up to your ankle kind of thing it's just a kind of a a gentle um, discouragement from walking on the grass And I think, you know, some of these colors are going to work, this this green will work its way up there later, but uh, that's all I need right now. Now I'm just taking a quick little look that I don't, I'm, there's not like a, a space in between the hands where there's, I should see the background. I think that looks good. Okay. Um, wow, all, all these comments here. What? Um, Olga says, "Good advice about doing your own thing." Thanks for the reminder. I wonder what process for transferring mural images to a large space. Okay, that's a great question, which I'll get to in a moment because uh, we'll talk all about the cartoon, right? Which so and wh where that term comes from in a moment. That's a great question, Olga. Thank you for asking. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, Marie was just joking about with Olga about that uh, Olga's in the future because she's in Australia. That's Again, I find that all very weird. Again, yeah, Saturday morning when it's Friday night here. Um, Marie's just going to do the skeleton. Uh, and... Olga says, great to see how you are simplifying the background. Do you think in blocks of color or shapes? Um, uh, the, the Sort of the best thing that I think, if you can think, how, how to describe that. So I, I try to think in shapes. I try to, I don't even, even know if it's shapes, but just I think of them as like steps. And I think about working my way down from high level, the, the the large details, and then slowly down to small details. So when I'm doing something like this, yes, there might be all sort, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll 
complexify <laughs> this the, the grass We're, we'll put more nuance in there we'll put more nuance in the trees but just generally they're going to be green right so here's just I guess you could think of this as a shape that I'm putting in here or shapes here I'm just sort of thinking okay I'm gonna break this up so it's not just one solid color we'll have some greens and purples in here and uh, like because I'll use the same process for doing the pant legs it's not like I'm I guess I'm thinking them of it as a shape but I'm just gonna get the general colors in uh, or what is more com well not more commonly more specifically known as the local color and the local color like so for instance if I say this tape the local color of this tape is green right it's not too far off from the greens that I have here so if I want if I was gonna make a, a, a you know photorealist painting of this tape the the I would mix a green like this and pr like if and I would paint the whole thing that color first right I'd paint the local color of and the local color is the color you know if somebody says what color is this they'll say green or somebody will say like here's this I use this for strengthening my hand um, people say what's the color of this oh well it's sort of like a teal right so then I'd mix a teal but of course there's not just teal here there's you know especially if we hold you know something I just don't know if it shows up on camera very well but there's reflected light coming onto this shape so there's yes there's gonna be some red in here there might be some yellow coming bouncing off here blue coming from my shirt so it gets more and more complex so I try to think about starting from the simplest the most obvious thing which is the local color putting those down and again the local another way to think of local color it's the color of something um, if you sort of take out the the contrasts made from the highlights and shadows right so let's speaking of this let's continue here let's put the local color down here which is going to be this kind of gray a bit of a little on the cooler side of a gray and again you could just squeeze this out of a tube to do it but I find great value in mixing my own grays so I'm going to take some let's do this here I think so I'll take some I need a little bit more cool blue and warm red if we mix this together I'm gonna get this purple it's a different purple than this purple right it's because these colors are almost opposite one another on the color wheel and because of that they're crossing through this neutral core which is uh, which kind of kills color it's, it's where all colors go to die <laughs> so I'm gonna add even a little bit more here I'm gonna add a little bit of this cool yellow and that's gonna really cancel out any color any purple and turn it into basically a totally gray color and so right now it's we can't see much I'll add a little bit of white to it to help clarify and it goes like well it's kind of on the blue side of a gray so that just tells me I had a lot of cool blue so let's add a little bit more warm uh, warm red into this gray again it's going a little bit purpley so I just need a lot more cool yellow and it's just the the managing your um, ratios here so when we mix this together we should be pretty close to a gray here there you go so that's about it like a, a really nice neutral gray let's if we look at the or original image there you know this might be a little bit on the darker side so let's just take some more white and mix this in here
leave just a little bit of room there so I can put some lines on the tiles here to kind of help give it this perspective the sense of the pathway leading right up in behind them Let's talk about cartoons here in a second, right after I do this, because it might be, I haven't, it's a good question, so it might be fun just to take a, a moment to see if we can find an image online. And I don't know the, the, the full story of the origin of the word cartoon. But I'm sure it's probably a very interesting story. I should know this because I've talked about this kind of stuff before. I just know the the kind of its use in art history. exactly what my plan is there yet so okay that's good so we've got um, the basics of the background done let's do a cold brown for the trees Okay, yeah, so Olga says, so first, determine the local color. Yeah, like, I think, um, like, the way that I, I paint is I just sort of try to think, like, you know, just generally, what is the color here? And, I, and my, my way of painting is definitely maybe a little bit slower than some people. Um, but I, I do think for a beginner painter, this makes a lot of sense, because... This gives me an option, like what I'm sort of doing here is I put down this underpainting and it gives me a chance just to mix the colors and see. Now they're, they're gonna change as I put another layer over top of them, but if I do this and I'm not too concerned about making it perfect, I can, like I could have said, you know what, I don't know if I'm feeling this green back there. Maybe instead it should be a red. Maybe I'll put a red brick wall in behind or something. So mixing the local color, putting it just quickly in behind, I go, okay, yeah, actually that kind of works. So I'm gonna continue working on it that way. Um, so it gives me, it's a little bit, gives me more freedom just to, to test things out. Um, and, and then also as I start painting on it, again, there's some nuance I can, I can kind of add, I can add a little bit of red and oranges and pinks and things in here um, so let's mix a cool brown so cool brown let's do this right here I'm gonna take some warm red and cool blue and mix this together so now we have a, a, a another purple right slightly different than this one it's because it's also a little bit closer towards the neutral core so it's going to be naturally darker and less saturated 
then these two, these two blues, the, 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 sorry, the warm blue, as opposed to the cool blue. And then let's take some cool yellow and mix this into this mixture. So, I'm just thinking to myself, what kind of a brown do I want? Do I want a more yellowy brown, a bluer brown, a, a reddish brown? And it's just changing the ratios again. Oh, and now I'm just so I'm looking at the image. <laughs> actually, maybe a reddish brown would actually work well. I was going to make a much lighter version of this, interesting, now that I see, hmm, so maybe I will go a little bit more red in my brown, huh, so I, was, I would not normally make a brown like this, very rarely make a very reddish brown like this, but smaller brush See, as I'm painting it, I'm sort of just letting it get a little bit wobbly in. because it's intended to be very organic, right? It's a it's a branch. These are going to be kind of disappearing into the tree, into the leaves, I think. Now, I'm going to do, let's do a little bit on this side. I'm just going to add a bit of white to that color just to make it go, these ones, a little bit further back. Maybe not quite. I'm just going to... This was a leaf there, but I'm just going to eliminate it. some other tree branches back there or another I think I'm just gonna take that out as well just for the sake of keeping things simple but maybe I'll put a little tree in here like that just so we get the hint that there's more you know there's trees coming from all over so having that in mind just before I move on here so there was I'm just gonna touch this area up here what was that that green And 
and let's just see. Just always sort of trying to be conscious of my horizon line, I'm trying to keep it straight because if that imaginary line kind of goes here and then just pops up all of a sudden, it just looks kind of strange. Maybe most people looking at it won't. Um... Oh, <laughs> I'm just cleaning my brushes in my tea. That's the first. I'm surprised it's taken me a year to do that, considering. <laughs> huh. I haven't done that. That's a add that. Uh, uh, that's a bummer. Okay. Well, I've got an emergency Red Bull. I might have to crack open. Uh, I wonder if that. I don't think that was on camera, but uh, okay. And I, I was just about to have some tea. So this is why I've had this Red Bull down here for probably six months. Because I knew one day I was going to need it. I would forget my tea, and, but in this instance, I just... Um, anyway, so, you know, one thing, this tree that I just painted there might be a little bit intense. We'll, I'm not even going to bother, like, I mean, it might be a little too saturated of a color, this brown. So I'll probably add a lot more white to it in the subsequent layer. And that's another good thing I can see about this. T the, like, the way that I'm painting right now is also much closer to the way most artists would paint their own artwork. Because I don't really know what I want to do yet. You know, like, you have to remember Diego Rivera, when he painted this painting, or any of the other artists who painted their paintings... They didn't, they didn't have the benefit of seeing the finished painting finished right next to them when they began the painting. They're making it up as they go along. So they don't know, um, uh, you know, what colors necessarily the finished painting is going to end up with. So but if you paint in this style, it gives you kind of flexibility because you can kind of see where, what things are at what time. And then you can modify them by adding a second, third, fourth layer ideally just a second layer versus what I see on YouTube a lot is people will try to mix the exact right color that they want the finished painting to look like and then apply that and then they finish each little piece and then they move on to another piece finish that so that you literally it sort of looks like the painting a finished painting is just developing outward right I try to get the whole painting covered with paint and let it dry and then go over it again with so then you have a finished underpainting and then you finish the painting over top of the underpainting that's this is it's a very traditional way of painting that artists have been using for uh, like in, in the western world for at least maybe 600 years and there's good reason for that right <laughs> So, I'm pretty happy with this as an underpainting right now, or the background anyway. Let's move on to the foreground. So again, there's a lot of detail in this. Let's look at the original here. Okay. So I'm going to be eliminating detail as we go here. Like I like this this color that that I just applied for the background. I might make this as a warm brown though, just to create an, like a nice separation between foreground and background. So maybe we should do a brown to start. Although we've got all this gray. Hmm. You know what, let's take this gray, because the gray is kind of a neutral color, right? I think I'm going to put this gray on first. I'm going to add a lot of white to it. And... What I'm considering here, I'm just wondering if this is going to be too difficult for people. 
even as I was outlining this, I was thinking to myself, maybe I should just, there's no point in doing all of this, drawing that detail, because it's probably ultimately easier just to paint over it. But will people be lost if I do that? Let me just see what this color, that gray. Let me think about it as I paint this area in here. I'm just going to paint right over this, her glasses. So, you know, some of those lines that I traced there are kind of gone, right? That's why I didn't even bother drawing all of them. If you were, if this kind of stresses you out a lot, one of the options you could do is just to add some glazing fluid into your gray to make it a little bit more transparent. I'm gonna keep going. I'm gonna take this same gray. So this area is sort of like underneath all of these. I don't. I don't know what. To, what should we call this? Like this feathered boa or snake boa thing um, around her neck. And because of the complexity of it. I'm just going to paint this like that. Because I've got all of this, um, all these little kind of feathery things, I can actually, it will be easier to do on their own and, and, to, and to do it sort of without a uh, guideline than it would be to try to paint it all following these the lines you'll I think you'll see what I mean when we get get there otherwise I'm gonna have to like get my tiny brush out right now to do it and it's just I'll just like that could end up taking like two or three hours to do this in a different uh, in using if we were to try to try to paint it um, uh, correctly I guess you could say right now even these fingers you know because I didn't even I, there's too much detail I just uh, I didn't even bother doing the like the the skeletons hand very well Okay, so that's good. I'm I'm happy with that. If you're if this is stressing you out, you can just <laughs> and you're watching this video later, skip to the point where I do this, and you'll go like, oh, okay, that makes sense. I, I see what he's he's did now. That's oh, well, I'm not so scared anymore because I'll just like she's holding Diego's hand. I'll hold your hand through this painting here. Um. So let's see. I can you still use this gray for a few other things. Let's maybe go right. I'm going to add a lot more white. And I'm going to do...
Again, you can see I just paint basically that whole shape right out. Which is gonna be way easier to do it like this than trying to do it perfect right now. Um, these little flowers, let me think. Maybe uh, let's add. Oh, I've got a little bit of red on there, but that's actually not bad. same maybe lighter gray I'll just put on her, uh, Frida's belt here I'm always sort of looking to see can I use this color that's on my brush right now anywhere else I'm gonna skip over that how about this lighter gray Let's even take, uh, I'm gonna take a bit of warm yellow. That's a lot, so let's just mix it in. this also over top back over here so it wasn't quite dark enough maybe I'll use the same color for the snake shape here his jacket what color could we do that in I'm just gonna give it a bit of a warm, very subtle warm red kind of. right over the frog in his pocket and the snake in his pocket because I don't even know if I'll do them it could be a little bit of a pain okay any more white The skull, I think I'll do do that in a moment. We'll put a little bit of, actually put some darker colors in there before I paint over it. So I'm gonna go the opposite direction here. Let's get all this extra paint off. And then I'm just make, I'm gonna take this dark gray that we mixed right off the top. Or not off the top, but 10 minutes ago. And just gonna put it in here. Again, you see, I'm just using a big, wide brush here.
Okay. We're going to take this same dark color. Let's put it on Diego's clothes here. Uh, I haven't forgotten about your question about the um, about car or about how to transfer images onto large surfaces. We'll talk about that here in a moment. Just want to get this underpainting done here. So. So this umbrella being black, I could keep it black, but part of me thinks maybe I should use a different color, maybe a red or something else in here. So I'm going to think about that for a moment. And I might even put a red in there, and I can always take, turn it black later. I'm just kind of feeling like it's just going to disappear in, into the rest of his clothes. So, and hopefully you've seen that I'm not, in, in, over these other videos, you've seen that I'm not afraid of modifying my painting from the original, as you, sh you should feel uh, welcome to make changes. To this or any of the other paintings that we make and have have some fun like there's been some what's great about this community of artists is we've seen people posting their versions of some of these really famous paintings and done really funny things to them and in order to make them more their own um, so you should feel like completely free to do that yourself. You know, you could you could paint your family members in this painting instead of Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo. You could uh, Death here could be wearing could be wearing a hockey jersey or a baseball hat or the feathers could be very colorful I mean you could really go absolutely wild and that should be should make for the paint for really fun painting right Okay. Well, again, <laughs> very active chat. So uh, I see Olga says, 
Good to hear you're thinking about breaking the painting down into management steps, because the painting looks really complex to me. Yes. Yes, absolutely. If you if you try to... It's almost like you have to think of the working that your way backwards through the painting. And that's why it can take... It's part of like learning how to paint is just doing a lot of it so that you, you start to understand the painting process and you can start to think of like where you ended and then you know you you could start to imagine what those steps would be for any other painting so that you can kind of think uh, rather than than trying to finish little pieces you're finishing the whole painting all at one time um, Deborah says hi everyone I came in late today I had visitors for the day it's this is such an interesting painting and Olga says yes it's an amazing painting and tutorial um, let me see Deborah says are you making a reference to my sneakers in the Darth Vader painting yes yes you've done a lot I mean there's a number of people who've, who've fiddled with some of these paintings and it is really fun it's fun for me to see as well um, because most of the time I'm just doing little tweaks to the painting um, and not doing radically different things, even though there's sometimes things that I, I, I think would be kind of fun to do. Because obviously then it, I would be sort of taking the painting <laughs> or this tutorial off the rails in a different direction. Um, but it is a lot of fun to see people's changing the paintings. Um... So, where should we go now? How about, let's get some warmer purple. And we can just basically, I think we can still use, is it all dry? It looks like it's a bit dry. Just gonna take this warm purple. I'll take a bit of white in here. Not as much as we did for that background for sure. And maybe this is coming off pretty intense, but... Remember, with your underpainting, it's kind of a chance to go a little bit bold, and then just to... because you can always dial everything back later on. The thing is, is that you're more likely to, if if you go, if you play really safe at this stage of the painting, it's it's very unlikely that you're going to decide to go wild later on. Because as the painting evolves, you start to become more and more precious with it. You put more and more time into it. So the likelihood that you're going to go like, hey, well, you know, I'm just going to change the color of her dress from from purple to green when I've put three hours of work in, like, probably not going to happen, right? But if you do it right now, there's like, you put 30 minutes, an hour into the painting, like, yeah, let's just have a little fun, see what this looks like. So, that's why it's always, I think, beneficial to, to you can use this part of the painting process to test out some different colors and see how they're coming together. A little purple in that wrap around her hair. Let's do this, her kind of shawl there. I'm just gonna take some of the cool red. A little bit of white on there.
one of the things I just think is amazing about Diego Rivera is often the complexity of these paintings, these big murals, can sometimes have like 40 to 100 different people in them, all sort of sandwiched on top of one another, like a like a low relief sculpture, and there's just it's just tons of stuff going on. For me, that's just like, how does somebody manage that mentally? All of that information, just for me, it's like it gives me almost a headache just looking at it, thinking like, how, like it's it's almost superhuman to me. Um, maybe there's other people out there who have have much larger brains <laughs> than me, and it's just like, ah, oh, it's not too hard. I I don't know. I it's I think it's absolutely spectacular. Okay. So let's. I'm gonna mix a kind of a gr a dark color again. Let's do this warm blue, warm red. Or sorry, cool blue, warm red. This gets our darkest color here. And then I'm gonna use that dark color to do a little bit of of detailing on the face so that I can paint over top of them. Let's make sure that's in focus. Actually, just before I do this, I'm going to blow dry this painting. So I just wanted to blow dry it so that now if I want to get in here and start doing a little bit of line work on the face, this I'm just going to do this quickly because I um, I don't want to, I'm not going to get all the details in, just the main thing so I don't lose these details in the next step. So let's just like Frida's eyebrow or eyebrows. It looks like she's got two eyebrows in this. She's famous for the unibrow, right? Like this is one of these these brushes that I bought a year ago for this class. You know, it's, the paint is chipping all off there. It's not in the best shape, but boy, has it lasted for more than long, much longer than I thought it would. That's all the detail I'm going to put on her face at the moment. And I can change the expressions and all that as we go here. You'll see that when I start putting paint over top of all of this, it's just going to 
change, so... And I'll, I'll repeat this dozens of times throughout today's episode. Remember that the original painting, these figures are roughly life-size, right? So this is a mural that was a big mural. I, if you're able to go to Mexico City and see it in person, hopefully the museum, I imagine it's probably back open with some social distancing in there it's really the there's it's a this mural is on display and there's a second floor with some sketches for the mural and then like a small space for um rotating uh curated exhibitions but the the almost the entire museum is just dedicated to this particular painting. We'll talk, let's have it. I'll talk about the history. Oh, I was going to talk about fresco painting here in a moment and cartoons. Just want to get that in. Maybe these fingers. Let's move this up. I'm just going to paint in these big eye sockets. I'm not going to bother doing any kind of detailing inside them. I can always enlarge them and all that kind of stuff later. It's pretty thick eyebrow. <laughs> So there's tons of little symbols in this painting. Right here we've got the yin and yang symbol. I'm not sure why he put that in there and why he has Frida holding it. this hand in later. Same thing. Just just outlining a few of those little details for myself so I can f I'll find them later. Uh Ok, 
Okay. Oh, let's see. Can I see where this... Good, so let's zoom back out. Let's zoom back out. So now I'm gonna mix a brown that we're gonna put on faces and shoes. This will be a warm brown. And we'll put white over the skeleton. Olga says, I'm multitasking reading about Diego and Frida's relationship. And it says, uh, so should I join the Facebook so I can see your response to these sessions? <laughs> Wink. Uh, and Deborah says, please join the group for it is a great group of people and you would enjoy the community. And Olga says, I wish we could visit Mexico, but fat chance for me for Aussies getting out of the country. Yeah. <laughs> Australia is in, in lockdown right now. Um, yeah, my sister works. She's a radiologist in a hospital in Sydney. So I've heard everything about the situation down there. You guys are sort of where, where we were last summer. You had a great summer last year. <laughs> and now you're getting the, the payback for it. So... Uh, yeah, I was going to mix a warm brown. Did I, did I mix a warm brown already or not? Um, so let's take some... Where should I do this? I'm going to put it right down here. I'm going to take some warm blue and warm red. Let's mix that together. And here we have a different purple, but check out this color. It just looks like a brown, right? And what is so interesting is most people, when they go to the art supply store, they're going to get three colors because they've heard of primary colors. So they go, okay, this looks like a really nice bright uh, yellow. So they get the cool yellow. They get their fire engine red, warm red, and they get their ultramarine blue which is a warm, so they got a warm blue, a warm red, and a cool yellow, and that's like, that's it. I'm gonna, and I've, I've, we've done this, I used to do this in my painting classes years ago. We would actually mix the color wheel with these three colors just to show people what the sort of typical uh, habit is for a lot of artists, and then they get to, they're like, okay, you get a pretty good green, not as bright a green, you get a, you get a really great orange, but when it comes to mix, mixing these purple values, it just looks... This is the, the brightest purple you can get. And people are like, well, that's a real bummer. Like, I basically have no purple. I've got a, a kind of a purpley brown. And that's because you're just... Because these colors are crossing pretty close to that neutral core. And you're, it's, just, it's just impossible to get a really nice purple unless you've got a magenta, a cool red in the mix. So, how's this brown? Let's keep on going here. Let's take a big heaping full of cool yellow and mix this in. And now we've got a bit of a brighter, warm brown. And... I'm gonna just add a bit more of that, and now let's mix this. Take this color. I'm gonna put it over here so that I can modify it. I'm gonna add some white to it to get a skin tone.
So these his skin tones are almost like a kind of got an orangey, orangey brown, or even peachy kind of quality. If you want to keep to get it to go too peachy, we, we'll just add more blue to it. See, I'm moving around on the palette here. There we go. Now I've got a bunch of different versions of my brown. Okay. This is the one I'll use. So let's uh, zoom in. Not bad, not bad. This is my local color. Be just putting it on a bit heavy, so. You can see why I painted those dark lines. If you haven't seen the movie Frida, I strongly recommend it. It's a great, great movie. Uh, I, did Selma Hike win an Academy Award for that? I can't remember. Um, it really helps give context to everything we've been talking about today. And you, you'll see kind of like how deeply involved Diego was as well as Frida in in many of the like the major global conflicts of the time like Frida Kahlo uh, I think it was during the time her and Diego were were married had an affair with um, oh I did it just escaped me um, the Russian writer activist oh my goodness why did it, it was just it was on the tip of my tongue and then I um, I'm sure somebody will remember for me uh, what's his name ah, it's gonna drive me nuts. the fellow who was murdered not too far from Frida's house Trotsky, that's right. So Frida Kahlo had a, had a tumultuous affair with Trotsky. Uh, Trotsky was Lenin's. I don't know if they were best friends, but they were they were good friends and and helped start the communist revolution with uh, Lenin and and Leon Trotsky. But like a lot of stuff that happened with communism, there was people were who were once heroes of the revolution, then became outcasts from the revolution and were hunted down and murdered or sent to, to Siberia to work camp. Same thing happened with Trotsky. He was a hero and then branded a traitor. He fled for his life to Mexico and some Soviet agents tracked him down and famously killed him in his house with was it an ice pick or or an icicle? I can't remember. I'm sure all of that's out there but um, I, uh, so, I mean, it just goes to show, like, how, you know, Leon Trotsky was a, was a major figure in, in the political life of, of the world, really, at the time, and him and Frida Kahlo were involved, and they, they, Rivera knew Trotsky very well. Because and Rivera was off having his affairs with all sorts of other women, and, um, uh, because Mexico was 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 a, a pretty important um, a place during the, the 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 early 20th century. There's a there's a lot of very famous writers who lived and worked in Mexico. Um, 
just gonna paint this face, put the white right over, I'm just gonna go right over top of all my lines here. I mean, I think if your if your news source is um, Fox News, or you might have the impression of Mexico as just being uh, a a place of that's very dangerous, that is basically a third world country, um, that. Yeah, this is not particularly technologically advanced or cosmopolitan. But that's why I strongly suggest everybody go to Mexico. Is go to Mexico City because, you know, my wife and I... What was the name of this restaurant that we went to? We went to, like, literally one of the top five best restaurants in the world. It, it cost us, like... It, this was a wedding present. It cost us... Our dinner was maybe $280. Um, is it P P Pujol? Pujol, I think is what it was called. But it was probably the best meal we've ever had. We were treated like celebrities. <laughs> I mean, you're spending that much money, yes. Um, but it was, I was absolutely amazing. And it was, it's, that restaurant is in the, basically the Beverly Hills of Mexico City. Like, we were walk. I literally, I went and bought a, a, a better dress shirt because I felt like, oh my goodness, we're walking down the street and I, f I felt like the poorest person in Mexico. <laughs> um, I, it's just one of those things that I think probably some people, when they hear that, are, are, find that hard to believe that they imagine Mexico is just a lot of poor people. Um, and there's certainly, when you're driving through the countryside and going to places, you do see some people that are living in poverty. But there's also places here in Canada where people are living in poverty. And, um, you know, there's where many of the indigenous people that live here in Canada are living in some pretty squalid um, uh, conditions. Uh, without running water or proper sanitation. So when everybody starts, and there's same sort of things in, I, I lived in Los Angeles for 12 years, and there's places in Los Angeles that are basically war zones. And uh, uh, I used to take the Greyhound years ago, and the Greyhound bus station is right down in Skid Row in downtown LA, and that is like, I mean, that is scary neighborhood. It's extremely sad like just if you think if, if you if you know Canada you, you, if you're a Canadian you've probably heard of the downtown east side in Vancouver and it is it's considered the poorest part of Canada there is people openly shooting heroin on the streets and there's uh, prostitution openly have drug deals happening and it is alarming but it's really located in about a three four block radius and I used to take to do walk uh, walking tours uh, as a volunteer thing and I used to take tours from around the world and we and I would just take them walking through that area in the daytime and then we would go and sit at a pub and have a beer and I would talk to them and say like what do you think is the what's an area of Vancouver that you were told to avoid and like oh there's the downtown east side is just is it's the most dangerous place in all of Canada and I'd be like Oh well, that's where we are right now. That's that corner's <laughs> right across the street there. That's Maine and Hastings. This is the most dangerous part of Canada. And like, oh, really? And especially any American tour servicing, like, right, this is the most dangerous part of Canada. Wow. Okay. And this is the poorest part of Canada. <laughs> you Canadians don't realize how good you have it, um, because uh, the uh, the Skid Row in Los Angeles is, uh, like, it's another world that is very similar to some places in L.A. that, or in Mexico City that we, we, we drove by or took buses and things through. Anyway, I just wanted, I just think that it's, um... Not, maybe not everybody listening is aware of all of, of all that, so... Okay. Uh, so... 
Oh, it's going to do the collar of a shirt. I'm just going to paint that white as well. Where did my white go? Here's some white. Okay, oh yeah, I mixed all these browns, because it's got this very orangey brown for these shoes. So let's, t I'm going to take warm yellow and warm red, mix them together, maybe a little bit more on the yellowy side. Let's take a bit of brown and put this in here. And just mix that back up here. I'm going to make these shoes kind of on the orangey side of things. going to paint these socks kind of this warm yellow just a little bit of that same color I didn't bother washing my brush so that's why it kind of has a bit more of this brownish hue to it and I'll put those stripes on later obviously what else do I want to do? The umbrella. What did I say? Maybe let's do, let's try doing a, what would be a very different color? What if I do do a red umbrella? Maybe I'll put a bit of white in my umbrella. I'm going to paint it white first, or kind of pinkish first, so I'm adding a bit of white to it. And then I'll paint it red afterwards. If I paint the this with warm red just right over top of it right now, it's just going to go too dark. And if I want this to kind of be a nice, oops, bright... Uh, warm red adding a little bit of white to the underpainting will allow it to really sing later on some white and uh, warm yellow there's a little bit of warm red it's kind of just a dirty paintbrush so
I'm just going to take this color and put this in the head of the... Oh, I forgot her hand there. Darn it. Okay. So that's why, you know, sometimes you, you miss these details. belt and then the feather boa I should probably put something there as a stand-in from right now what color could we probably put it like kind of icy um, green a little bit so let's do that let's take or maybe teal a little cold blue like that maybe what about if I uh, maybe it's good a little bit green I'm so excited because I'm almost done all of the underpainting. Which, you know, it's taken us two hours to get to this point. Which, you know, seems like a lot of time. But we've solved a lot of problems here. So, like, if I... Now that if I zoom back out, I think I've covered... All of the yellow on the canvas. And let's just look at them side by side. Great. So what I would say is, you know, this would this is a great time if you wanted to stop for the day and work on do something else, <laughs> go for dinner. This would be a great place to end your painting for for today's session. I'm going to carry on and finish it today. And it's probably going to take me another couple of hours to do so. But this is where you want... Uh, this is where I would like to get an underpainting to. Where I've just covered the surface with, it, with paint. And then now I can start dialing back in. I'm going to go into the background now. I'm going to finish the background. And then I'm gonna start working back on back towards the foreground again. So, um, let's just. Just adding a little bit of color into an area that I missed. brushes I don't good idea to clean your brushes right here too Heidi says hi everyone I've just been listening and finishing yesterday's painting and I've seen the freedom movie it is very informative um, hmm what should we do next in terms of the background if I look at the background I'm, I'm pretty happy with the way that I've sort of put these colors in there. So I can just sort of define things a little bit more. But I do like the, you know, there is a certain amount of the, this, that, that kind of looks a little bit like the background that he painted. He's obviously done all this little pointless stuff. I'm not going to do that at all. Um, Maybe I should start by lightening up this tree. So to do that tree, I made a cold brown. Oops. Let's make a cold. This this cold brown's kind of all done. So let's take some uh, cold blue, cold red, and a bit of cold yellow.
And I, I keep forgetting that this is a bit more of the on the reddish side of things, this tree, right? So this is pretty close to the color we had there, but I'm going to add a substantial amount of white to that. Closer in here. Okay. So I can kind of paint it in a way over top of my lines, which sort of makes, I can use the original color I put there and kind of use it to kind of create the outlines. All right, so that's one thing that I often will do is paint a darker color and then paint a lighter color over top of it. And that can make doing the outlines, like there's the outline already done, right? without now having to get a brush and go right very carefully around that area. So also what I've done is by lightening that up with a little bit of uh, white, by, by tinting, tinting it, it takes some of the, because it's now less saturated and it just wants to kind of sit a little bit further back in space, it's not competing so much with my foreground characters, which is what I want. There's some detail, like the bark on these trees. I'm just gonna leave that off for right now. Maybe I won't even, we'll see if I get to it or not, not sure. So now let's do some of these trees and things back there, the leaves. Let's take some bunch of cool yellow, and there's got a bit of some d darker colors on there, I don't mind that. Um, I'm just going to make a batch of this. I'm gonna make a couple little batches of colors. there.
So I'm going to kind of jump around with different colors on my brush. I'm going to do this a bit impressionist style. I think it might have a bit of a Easter egg thing going on here. That's all right. I think I'll actually keep this zoomed out since I'm kind of bouncing around the whole canvas. One thing I'm grateful for in this exact moment is our daughter was not very happy this morning. It almost seemed like she was a little bit under the weather and was crying and our poor nanny was having a tough time. Yeah, but now I can hear a little bit of laughter and um, that makes me happy. It's the little things in life, right? So as I'm moving around, like the painting is, all of these colors I'm putting down here are kind of wet and it gives me an opportunity to do a little bit of blending, which is kind of hard to do with acrylic paint. But if things are wet, you can kind of get away with it a little bit, right?
let's spend just another couple minutes on this and then I'll move on but uh, it's actually quite a lot kind of fun <laughs> just to play around so my purpose is is really is I'm kind of in some ways I'm just trying to complicate the background and just put in a bunch of colors and kind of softer colors back here When I'm doing this, I often my I kind of let my eyes get a bit crossed, so that I just I'm just kind of I don't know how to describe it. I I just let I'm, I'm moving almost faster than my brain can can uh, can process things and just. Filling color in quickly. Doesn't always mean that the end result is, is particularly good. So I might need to do a little bit more as the painting progresses. The, the rest of the painting will sort of tell me what it needs. I'm sure I'll need to do a little bit of tidying up back here, but... And I overlapped the tree a little bit, so I'll probably do a little bit of outlining, take a little bit of magenta, but I'll do that later on. Maybe down here in the grass, let's just play with this just a little bit. Different direction for these brush strokes.
Deborah says, my parents lived near LA in California on a wealthy street, a block away were cement block houses with no windows, not unlike developing countries. Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, Heidi says, uh, I have not seen houses with no windows, even in developing countries. Oh yeah, they're absolutely. Uh, there's there's lots of places that don't have windows on their houses. Um, uh, uh, Brazil, like some of the flavelas in Brazil, are basically made of tin and cardboard, and when it rains, the whole house basically collapses. Yeah, there's there's many places that have no windows, no doors. I mean, there's there's places that in wealthy countries that have no windows or doors because the weather is 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 generally fairly good that they don't need like I've been to places in Hawaii restaurants that that just have like at night they just put a gate that closes it but the wind is blowing right through so you don't have to be necessarily poor to have areas that don't have windows but um Yes, there's many places that don't have windows. I just want to get a bit more purple. Oops. should we do next here now that I've got my background not completely finished because like I said I think there's gonna be some changes that will happen after I get more of the foreground done there might be a little bit of outlining I might take a little bit of slightly darker color and give it a little bit more definition to these areas here and there might be I could even add a little tiny bits of orange the one thing, especially, there's a few things I have in mind, like, the reason why I haven't added even more color is because I haven't done the foreground yet, and I don't really know what this will, I have a good idea with the colors I've put here, but already I'm feeling, wow, that's, that's pretty bright, there's a lot of stuff going on in the background, and I don't want it to drown out the foreground. Because at the moment, right here, I mean, these boots are kind of orange, but they're going to go brown. Right? If I look at this image, even just right here, the background is really, really bright and saturated. So, generally, you want your background to be more muted in the foreground. So, that right now is telling me, okay, I mean, there's some tint, like whites... Or, or white colors, white in these colors, which makes them go back. But everything forward here needs to be more saturated. And I got a bunch of gray here. So, you know, maybe the, the feather boa here, snake thing, uh, needs to be... Well, well there will be a lot of color there. That makes, makes me feel better about the choice to make this umbrella like a bright red. Um, I might brighten up, maybe even change the color of, of his hat and the like the scarf in her hair, maybe put some colorful flowers in the skeleton, you know, make his socks nice. So anyway, I'm just thinking about like, that's why I don't want to do any more work. I'm not going to finish the background just yet because there's decisions that still need to be made. So in fact, let's now 
since I was talking about this umbrella, let's I'm gonna paint it red just right now, make an executive decision. And we'll see. I mean, it's I, I, I may probably glaze a bit to, so it's not just such like a bright red. But already, it's like, oh, okay, good. This is this bright red umbrella is leaping forward over top of the more pastel colors in the background, which was my whole intent to begin with. Just looking at... shape of that umbrella. Part of me thinks I, I, it, about doing the similar thing we did yesterday, which was to maybe tackle the faces earlier on, because that might give people some hope that the painting is going to actually turn out. Um, the other thing I... Oh, I forgot to do down here. This, uh, okay, I want to just, I want to finish this area down there. I'm going to mix a, a gray. And you can use or the, what I usually use is is um, warm red and cold blue to create a gray. I was trying to use it with just the leftovers there, but there wasn't quite enough. And I put a bit of cool yellow in it. There we go. Want to use this to paint this railing here. Tidy up some of the ground just a bit too. Hmm. Not 
super happy with this. A little bit too low. To the ground there. So I'm going to take some of this green. my gray I'll wait for that green to dry a little bit while I do these lines So I don't mind them getting a little bit wide and uneven because I'm going to give them a little bit more nuance here. I'll go over top of some of this gray. I really probably should have done this earlier but you know let's do it when you can I do I'm just looking at these lines here, trying to, because I, I, I drew them out. So I kind of used the drawing to kind of help solve some of those problems. And So I'm going to take this gray, let's give it some more white.
And I actually want the slightly different color gray than what I had there originally. It's actually, I kind of mixed the color almost too well. It's too close to the original, so I'm, I'll, I'll modify it here in a moment. Let's just get a bit more white on there. There's one direction. Let's can we go a little bit darker? Okay, so just kind of give that a bit more nuance there, right? Okay, let's keep on plowing along. So I, I might add a little bit of black lines here, maybe even with an acrylic pen towards the end. So my goal would be to finish in about an hour and a half, which I know is like takes me to about a four hour painting. But all of this is just gonna take me some time. So I, I totally understand if some people <laughs> tune in and tune out as the evening wears on. And for some people it's uh, approaching 10 o'clock on the East Coast. So we may see you in the recorded version of the episode, I'm gonna mute my and just my microphone and and just give it a blow dry so everything kind of um, cures a little bit here.
Okay, so I just wanted to lock everything down so that if I... I think I might move on to... I might do, like, faces. I might start working my way down the painting this way. So I want to make sure that the, what I was doing just down here in the bottom stays where it is. And I don't start, you know, smudging things as I go get down there. Um, the other thing, too, you could do, even at, as we start going is literally washing all the paint off of your palette if it's starting to kind of get a little bit um, uh, sometimes the paint just starts to as it dries it gets a little gummy and it's not as pleasurable to paint with um, so let's do these faces So, any speaking of paint, let's see. Let's take some. Let's maybe mix this a bit again here. Some warm yellow and warm red. Let's take a bit of white. And a little bit of blue. Let's zoom in and we'll we'll spend the next like half hour doing uh, Frida and Diego's face here. Their faces. <laughs> I could be doing this with glazing. I'm just going to kind of do this a little bit faster just to kind of get some paint in here a little bit of the same color here. Let's just take a look at hands.
must have just picked up some paint. might just use should I use my um, acrylic pen this is the black one right is this black one yeah It's a little big, isn't it? That's okay, because since it's acrylic paint, I can paint over it, do whatever I want. Sounds like our daughter's not having the best uh, afternoon after all. Hmm. I was hoping she would be have improved over the course of the day, but I can hear her. Struggling a little bit up there. Should be just doing this as a glaze, right? Why am I?
a little wet. Oops. You know, so this is a part of the painting where it's there's a bit of frustration here on my part. Things aren't haven't quite turned out the way I wanted, so I've got to keep kind of massaging it a bit. It looks a little bit like that. Behold the monkey painting we did for <laughs> um, uh, April Fool's Day. much wet paint on here. I keep just m moving kind of this blocks of wet paint here. So it's going to blow dry this. Yeah, the I see in the chat there you guys are talking about is was the background done with a pointless technique for sure, absolutely. Obviously, again, remember that this face here is a is the same size as my head in real life. 
it's a so I'm trying to to take something that was much larger and paint it on a on a scale about a tenth the size, right? trying to dig myself out of a bit of a hole that I created for myself. I think it's the part of it is because I was trying to do both faces at the exact same time, which is a, a foolhardy. So let's, which one should I focus on? Let's do Diego first here. So you can see there's a bit of kind of, a bit of almost a, a green in the shadows in the face. So I don't know if I'm going to use those markers again uh, for this, just because the lines are just too sharp. And it doesn't seem to fit with like the style of this painting. 
So I need to make my own dark color. It's not quite as intense. So there's a bit of warm or sorry cool blue and warm red oops sorry I probably I could use a little bit of black I'm, I know he used black um, but for this part Maybe at the end, I could do a little bit of outlining with some black. I should probably get the hat color sorted first before I go any further. So I'm just going to make this gray. Let's take a bit of warm yellow. Add a bit more white.
I kind of made his eyes a little bit too narrow and closed. Diego Rivera is like just is kind of famous for these big beady bug-like eyes. And so I need to get that back up there. Okay, I might just move on from him for a few minutes. <laughs> um, so let's work on her face now. I think we need to lighten up her skin a bit. So we'll just do this kind of over, I think. Add some glazing fluid back in here.
So just, just very incremental kind of adding just a little bit more of one color into the color just so it's happening very slowly. Let's go back to this dark color. So I'm going to take this dark color, I'm going to mix it in with my lighter color that I was using just a few moments ago. It's going to mix, uh, get a kind of a lip color. This lip needs to just come.
uh, Olga says, how to line up the eyes. Hmm. Um... Uh, lining up the eyes can be tricky. I guess I look for... Like the the angle of the face. direction her head is sort of pointed in. Ears going a little too low, isn't it? Yeah, it's... Okay, I think I might um, move on from this face in just a couple of seconds here. Because there's still lots more to do here. And I think as I paint on it, it will tell me what needs to be done. Like, I, there's probably. I, well, let's see if I can fix that right now before I move on. lightened things a bit.
Okay, so let's, uh, I'm gonna motor through here because there's still so much more to do. Um, I'm just an trying to answer a couple questions. Uh, or Olga says, thanks for taking us through the problem solving. It's useful to me better than watching an edited per perfect from beginning to end painting. <laughs> so, you know, just a little, you know, obviously I was, what I was trying to do was I mixed like a flesh tone and I thought you know I'll just use it for both faces even though they're not the same color flesh tone anyway just because I started to want to hurry the painting a little bit and one thing that happens if, if I do that is I can sort of I, I my tension split now between two different faces and you know it's like I was trying to be a chess player who plays multiple games at the same time <laughs> I'm not that good of a chess player, and I'm not that good of a painter. I'm my brain is just not that big, um, so I just had to like go stop. Let's reboot. You know, it's like your computer is experiencing problems. Just shut it down. Wait 30 seconds. Start it up over again. All right. So that's what I did. I and um, and you know it's a reasonable, okay job of of. Uh, digging myself out of a hole. I'm going to move on to the skeleton's face here too since I'm I'm doing faces. Let's just uh, do this one and then I'm going to try to do most of the rest of it. I think I can do in a relatively reasonable amount of time here because I just that I put myself in a hole that took me about 45 minutes to dig back out. So again, one of my favorite quotes of all time is slow down we're in a hurry <laughs> so sometimes when you think like okay I'm gonna do something real fast it's gonna solve I'm gonna cut a bunch of corners and then you end up having to not only go back and erase all your mistakes but then start all over and go the speed you were planning that you didn't want to go at the beginning right so it's just good things take time and you just sometimes just have to to take a breath and and, uh, <laughs> anyway, it's not the, you know, I, I'm, I'm not as good of a painter as, as Diego Rivera, one of the greatest artists of all time. <laughs> it's humbling. Uh, but, um, slowly... As I, the more and more paintings I do, the better and better I get. I just have to remember that um, even when I, I make, like making a mistake like that is, is painful. It's a little embarrassing to do while you're streaming live and people are watching. But the, if I can take something away from it and feel like I've learned something from it, then it's not embarrassing it or a waste of time it was actually really helpful so the what i think is helpful about that kind of thing is just reminds me of the importance of just sometimes going a little bit slower maybe not trying to bite off more than i can chew you know i guess there's something also to be said you know it's it's good to kind of check in with yourself and push yourself a little bit take a little bit of a risk and just see well maybe i can do these at the same time and i've done a few things like that over the past year where i've tackled paintings that i thought might be a little bit outside of my range of ability and pulled them off and it's a huge confidence booster so uh, you never know if you can do it until you try to do it, right? I mean, doing some of these details <laughs> with a brush, especially these cheap year-old brushes, is 
It's tricky. And again, just as a reminder, remember this skull that I'm painting right now would be at least the size of the canvas I'm working on in real life. So it is, I'm painting it, it's currently just a little bit bigger than my fingernail. In real life, it would be the size of my own head is the way that it was originally painted on, on this mural. So... If you're painting it and you're you're getting a little bit freaked out, just it's worth just a quick reminder that this is originally a very big painting. There's a lot of detail in it. There's a, oh, there's a bunch of things I keep forgetting to talk about that...
So these are tiny details here working in this little space. Simplifying that, even though it doesn't really look anything like the, the original. Okay, I'm getting closer to this feathered boa thing, and we'll. I think I'll tackle that next, and then I'll come back to the skeleton's hair and all that kind of thing. Okay, so maybe let's just take a zoom out, take a second, take a little break, and see where we're at. For all this time I've been painting on it. Whew. So one thing I would do is probably shave a little bit of that cheek. She's got a bit more of a angular face, less of a round face. So, um, uh, Olga says the yin yang symbolizes Rivera and Kahlo's uh, complex relationship. Not not surprised that that's the on and off. When was this painting? Forty-six, forty-nine. So, so what? They got married in nineteen twenty-nine, got divorced in nineteen thirty-nine, remarried in nineteen forty. So, yeah, this is after they got divorced <laughs> and remarried. That they uh, that it's included that she's holding that in the painting. That's, that makes sense. Um, well, this is a great job on Diego's face. Uh, any tips on how to line up the eyes so they look uniform? Um, I guess, I, I don't know, uh, you mean, like, so that they're not out of, is that, uh, I mean, one, I guess one way to do it is to think about the nose and like the, the try to get the nose straight and if the nose is straight then the eyes are perpendicular to the nose all right so you know it's i guess that's pretty straightforward on diego's face because he's his face is pretty straight on whereas frida's face is on a bit of an angle so getting her eyes there is a little bit trickier but if you think of like that being it being tilted like that then the eyes are also just going to be perpendicular to that. Does that make sense? Um, you're a great teacher, Michael, not just with the practical painting el elements aspects, but also with problem solving and decision making and showing how to simplify the complex. Thank you. Well, that's very nice of you to say, Olga. Um, I think like the the part of like problem solving really just comes from doing a lot of painting, um, and also and by doing a lot of painting you will encounter a lot of problems, and the more problems you encounter, the more you're forced to dig yourself out of the problem, and you don't always succeed, but every once in a while you will, maybe one out of ten times you 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 dig yourself out of a hole and really that's sometimes that's all it takes is that you're like oh I managed to solve my problem like wow okay that's encouraging yeah maybe 
now the goal is to increase the the my ratio my success rate right and okay I've done it once I know that I can take a problem and transform it into a positive let's try it again and and then you get maybe two out of ten times you manage to to work your way out of that problem and slowly you get to the point where maybe nine out of you know it's, it could take years it's taken me a couple decades of painting but you get to the point where where I'm generally pretty confident that I can dig my way out of a problem not completely solve it like I'm not saying I've completely fixed this and there might be a little bit more but I've you know there was a point in this painting about an hour and a half ago where it was like you know the the cold sweats start to happen and you're like oh no this is and but I but I've been in that situation enough where I'm like okay deep breath okay what is the problem here let's just examine this back out a little bit kind of put the brush down for a second and just think okay and then maybe and then kind of breaking it into smaller things like so okay let's just I'm trying to do too much at once let's stop trying to do let's pick a face and work on one face at a time <laughs> You know, I don't know. It's like this. It's a, the kind of thing that we all run into p some kind of problem at some point, and you got to kind of figure your way back out of it. And um, so I appreciate the the generous uh, comments there, Olga. <laughs> um, so let's do the boa. Oh, there was. I might just turn this whole... Th well, we'll see what I do down here. Am I going to make this into a, a spine? Because there's this kind of spinal thing here. So the way to do this kind of thing... Or actually, maybe I'll explain it back on this image. Is I'm going to start down here and then paint my way up so that I'm layering over top of colors. Now... What colors do I want to use is the main question. I think I'm sort of talking about using some uh, brighter colors before. So maybe let's take some cool yellow. I often find like the cool colors tend to be the most like bright candy colored colors. So we'll have like a cool yellow. Um, just gonna clean that brush. Even though, yeah, I guess there's a bit of yellow in there, and I can always paint this with kind of pretty bright, saturated colors, and then change my mind and go for something a little bit more muted. Uh, and let's even do—I'll do one with some warm blue, even. Now he's gone really light with these. Um, let's do a warm red. Be nice to kind of match it with the umbrella. Warm red, warm yellow, warm yellow. What else? Oh, there's a green. Maybe I can steal some of that green. Okay. So I've just prepped a few colors just to get started, and I'll probably dip back into this well here. Let's start with this warm red, the kind of pink. And.
do a few of these up here. We'll see if... Mm. It's not how I was intending to do it, but I just figured... Let's just see if I can make this work a little bit. I don't know. That's probably let's so I'll just do a few. Let's go to this. Cool yellow. Maybe, maybe what I'll do is do the top and bottom, because this other side up here is going the other way. So maybe this is one way that I can... Maximize some time. We'll see if this works.
Hmm, this is working a bit, but not as well as I was hoping it was going to work. Thought I could kind of do this and just fly through this part, but... kind of getting the hang of it like the whole idea is to overlap these shapes it's also one of those things that looks better in in um, as it accumulates mass than kind of just on its own And it might just be one of those things where, you know, especially when I'm, my nose is right up close to the painting, I'm not too happy with it, but then as I back away and uh, when it gets closer to being done, it's like, ah, actually, it's not, didn't turn out so bad. Now, I imagine he used a very different method to do this. I think he probably would have just drawn it all out and then painted each one. One thing we could do uh, is you, we could paint this these colors in and then outline things. And that outlining process would definitely, you know, pull it together pretty quickly and elevate it. Out, as outlining tends to do, um, it just always tends to make everything look a little bit cleaner and sharper. And so I could use like a dark, singular dark color as he's done. He sort of outlined everything with black.
And I imagine that would, would create a pretty cool effect for sure. about is I'm, I've put a lot of white in here and now it's sort of very similar colors that I have in the background I don't know that's not something I'm super happy about because I would like for there to be it to be sitting right in the foreground rather than reminding me of the, the background, but let's just, I'm going to continue this process. It's, it's, I think it's okay. I mean, I'm not but uh, I think just in terms of like the, the my time constraint, although it's you know just seem to be going on forever. <laughs> um, I can't really think of another solution that. would uh, work at you know with this kind of speed so Yeah, I think if I outline that, that would look great. Do I want to do the outline? I could use my gray um, acrylic pen to do some of that. <sighs> Let me think. Okay. Just a lot of line work going forward, so.
Okay, so moving right along here, let's... Do a little bit of outlining on this dress. Oops. I'm just using kind of available colors. Taking a bit of glazing fluid to this purple just to get it a bit thinner. I'm going to go the other way here. probably going to end up just outlining a bunch of things and outlining I remember I had a painting teacher who'd always say that like outlining is the the lazy way to make a painting but there are plenty of very very well-known artists that outlined things Including Diego Rivera himself, you see him doing using outlining, like in the boa. There, right. So let's just take another zoom back out now that we've got a little bit more done here. drop my paintbrush and had to bend down to pick it up and I'm like wow my legs are sore a 
I'm surprised how many people are have been watching throughout the entire show here. Um, I'm super curious to see what people have been making. I can't wait till you guys upload your versions of today's painting, whether you're painting along with me here or you're creating something totally different on your own. It's so neat to see what people create. So, um, you know, a big part of my goal with these shows is I don't want this to be just a one way street here where. People are just watching me, so it's really exciting for me to see what other people have been doing. So please uh, consider joining that Facebook group, uploading your version of the painting, or anything else you've been doing throughout these this today's episode. I'm just making a really nice dark color again. I'm going to go into the hat of the skeleton figure here. Oh, you know what? I was going to show... Um, might be a good idea to take a second here. A little mini break. Um, what did I want to show? Uh, I mentioned this yesterday. Diego Rivera's biography, autobiography, is an excellent book. Um... That's highly recommend. There's a link in the description below. It's called My Life, My Art, uh, or Art, My Art, My Life. I can't. What what did it, what was it here? I gotta. My Art, My Life. Yeah. Um. So we were people were asking. I'm not sure who it was. How do you get a, an image onto a fresco? How do you make something um, really, really big? So, the way that artists, like here we see a lot of images of uh, by Michelangelo here. Um, like this is an image from the Sistine Chapel. So what artists would, actually this looks like his fresco method here. Uh, artists would make big drawings on paper and take those drawings and then poke all sorts of little holes all over, hundreds of little holes just like this, and then take those, the, the cartoons, these big pieces of paper, hold them up against the wall where they want it to go so they'd line it up perfectly, and then take a bag of loose charcoal, like, a, like in a sock basically, and just take that and just bang it all over the paper so that that charcoal powder is going through the holes onto the wall and then you peel the cartoon off and then you see the, this dotted line all over the wall. Very, very few of these cartoons survived because why would an artist save the cartoon? The cartoon would usually probably just go in the fire at the end of the night to keep the place warm. There's no... I mean, the only, really, I, I imagine most of the cartoons that survive are probably from an assistant who might have been working with an artist um, who kind of just took it home and was like, hey, guess what I took my boss's, my boss, Michelangelo, I took his cartoon, some, he was just going to throw him away, and um, yeah, because there, there, there would be... It's not like you were going to reuse it and do a second Sistine Chapel somewhere else. Um, a fresco, like, and these cartoons are generally done very quickly. Sometimes they'd be done by the artist themselves, or sometimes they'd be done by an assistant. So somebody like Michelangelo would do a whole bunch of sketches on smaller paper or, or parchment, um, and then probably hand them off to another artist who would grid it out. Uh, to enlarge it and if you're interested you want to know how to grid and to enlarge things I did a whole episode in my how to draw painting or how to draw drawing series um, Where I, I talk about taking a small image Doubling the size you can also do the exact opposite where you take a larger image and then shrink it down by using a grid So that's what artists would do and it's a slow painstaking process. It's 
So that's why I imagine probably it would be something you would give to an assistant. Uh, <laughs> you'd be like, here, take this sketch that I did, and then here's this piece of paper, was it the sketch on the size of like maybe 9 by 12, like we're working here, and then grid it out, enlarge it onto this piece of paper that's 9 feet by 12 feet, like a big piece of, of paper, like, you know, one of those big rolls of paper you see in elementary schools enlarge it that size and then poke a whole bunch of little holes on there and then or, or maybe before we poke holes i'll just come and take a look and make sure it looks good then you poke a bunch of holes on there and then i'll position it onto the wall you take the charcoal dust or maybe you hold it and i'll stand back with the with the sock or i'll get somebody else to do that so i don't have to breathe in all of that toxic powder which you know you all of the materials artists were using really up until maybe 15 years ago were pretty toxic like the artists all of the i mean you can see why some artists died relatively young it wasn't always because of alcoholism or suicide uh sometimes it was like literally the toxic materials in fact i was just watching that bob ross documentary where they suggest that it was the turpentine that he was using when he's banging his brush and he's saying beat the devil out of the brush that it's aerosolizing all of the turpentine and he's breathing it in which is probably true but whether that caused his cancer i'm a little bit uh, doubtful but anyway let's um hopefully that answers a little bit of the questions people were having about the fresco i'm sure that there's like okay here you go and look who's who we we're talking about here's diego rivera transferring the uh, a cartoon onto all that's see look at imagine here's who's this i don't know you can see her with a in her hand I, i'm sure that's a, a big ball of charcoal let's see any other here shows the the, the fresco method so they've drawn out where things go right applying the 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 plaster onto the wall and then painting into it All right anyway let's continue the painting <laughs> Uh, but I, th I think it's really interesting, so I'm glad that uh, the question was asked. I'm, again, I'm sorry, I can't remember who asked the question, but... Um, uh, and that's just a very brief introduction to... But again, I'm sure there's hundreds of videos explaining it, uh, people showing the technique, and the his you know lots of history on that. But uh, there is, I think there's a... If I recall, there is a cartoon at the National Gallery of Art in London, England. Uh, might have is it? A, might even be a Leonardo cartoon from one of the lost murals that he did. There, there was a there was a very famous Michelangelo was hired to do a mural, and Leonardo were hired hired to do a mural side by side in Florence by the Medici's. And then uh, there was a big war, and they had to abandon it. And actually, yeah, Michelangelo, all that exists of Michelangelo's is a, a copy that somebody made. So somebody was, while he was, as he finished it, someone made a painting of it, and that's all that survives is the painting of the mural. I don't know if uh, anything survives of Leonardo's. I don't know if anyone did a copy of it. Leonardo was famously kind of slow and he didn't finish everything <laughs> he was you know anyway let's continue with this and I can talk while I'm painting here um, well, it's gonna be um, I think I'm just gonna darken the inside of this let's zoom in my wife is going to kill me for spending, taking so long today, so. Ooh, you're going to just try to get more done more quickly here. Looking at the time, okay, so. Yeah, I'm not going to be popular with the family tonight, but.
he can't even see what I'm doing. What am I thinking here? Sorry. Uh, let's get a bit of white. And just once again, I'll just remind everyone that this painting is a mural, originally, that was would have been life-size. All I've, And I've seen it in person, I've stood in front of it, my wife and I, she was very uh, patient with me because I, she knows this is one of my favorite paintings of all time, so she just sat down and just watched me kind of... <laughs> Going around, looking at it carefully, taking tons of photos. Alameda Park is like this beautiful park right in the middle of Mexico City that uh, has like a bunch of markets. Well, not mark, but like kind of like, uh, what do you call those? Like food trucks, but not, I mean, more like food stalls. Um, especially at night, they all open up and can wander through there's um, just like tons of people always walking around it's I don't know if it's like a central park it's it's kind of I don't know how do you would what um, it's the kind of thing we don't really have too much in North America like North America like I guess it's the cool it'd be kind of like a shopping center well, they have shopping centers in Mexico too, so uh, I don't. I, it's one of those things that when you travel, you're like, oh, I wish we had things like this back home. This would be cool if we had. Um, let's see these shapes. What's the fastest, best way to do that? What if we take some white? A bit of pink on it, maybe just to give us something a little bit different. I think I need a bit of more gray.
let's get a dark in that. I think I need to make a little bit more of my dark color again. So I intended these to be a little bit more red, but the mix I made was a little more bluish, but that's okay. Let's, uh, maybe I'll do the opposite then. Let's take this dark color, get some red on the feathers.
I know I'm deviating from the original. I'm just... doing my thing. And sometimes that thing is different than the real thing. Part of it is out of just my speed and I'm kind of not really looking at the original too closely because I'm just getting very anxious with time and my poor wife is dealing with her, her daughter all by herself so I'm thinking oh geez I gotta like the other part is I do want to make this as different from the background as possible. Maybe a little more white would be more appropriate, I don't know. I can always lighten it up. Yeah, I'll come back to this. I'm not super, super happy with the way that looks right now, but um, still plenty of other things to occupy my attention. Um, Olga says, art on buildings is related to frescoes. Yes, fresco making is... is definitely very uncommon today very few people paint frescoes if I mean I'm sure there's probably somebody somewhere doing it but it's at this point it's kind of like a lost art um, just because the the technique is time-consuming and it's not the most stable like now there's all sorts of synthetic paints that people can use that um, that are more light fast uh, that are gonna last longer um, that are more resistant to weather so they can be done outside so most mural paintings are done with acrylic paint just like latex house paint Frescoes are mostly for indoors because once you know you don't want that plaster getting wet, so dark purple here.
the way she's holding that is so kind of um, it's it's a little strange I'm just gonna make that her thumb a little bit smaller than he did help it make a little more sense. And then, I wish I'd lighten the purple down there and repaint it real quick. Let me get it this more magenta. Olga says, I love the deviation. Shows how to creatively adapt and riff on others and be innovative. I gotta go now. Thanks so much for your teaching and answering my questions. I appreciate. Thank you, Olga. Have a wonderful rest of your evening and good weekend. We'll see you tomorrow, perhaps, with our when we paint the ghost. So let's do her dress down here. Let's use maybe let's put a bit of make this a bit more orangey.
Um, okay. I'm gonna do two colors on these socks here. I guess there's three, right? Uh, the boots and all that stuff. All right, keep in mind, this boot is the size of my entire painting. Um, i got to mix another brown. Too much. Let's take some warm red, warm yellow. And a little bit of warm brown. a bit of this too so just utilize the color that's there rather than just painting right over top of it Using that glaze just to do a little outline there. I just think outlines just tie everything together so quickly and cleanly that you can see why artists will sometimes rely on them a little bit too much. If you think, if you see it that way, I like using outlines. I like them. I guess I, I also um, used to read a lot of comic books, and I'm drawing a comic book, and a big part of comics is the outline. It's just a, a convention is used a lot in comics, and. As I said, I've literally had teachers tell me not to to do it. that dry for a few moments let's do some of the lines on her dress
just take some of this warm red since I haven't used much of it. It won't be quite as gray, but it might be kind of a nice little... Actually, yeah, I'm going to go with that. I like that. I wasn't planning on using this color, but I think it'll work well with the for her dress. And John pops in and says, hello. Hello, John. I hope you're having a great night. Okay, let's continue. Uh, those boots have started to dry a bit, which is good. So now I can kind of come in with a darker color for the soles and potentially outlining anything. I just it just occurs to me that these look like the uh, uh, what is the name of these um, I, also, I have some of these boots what are they called uh, Australian um, brand. They used to, they were like the rage for a while, and I loved. I wore these. I had a pair of these boots. I don't think these were the ones that he's wearing were made in Australia. It, That's when I think of stuff like that, and I can't remember. Um, surely somebody watching right now remembers what the names of these boots are. Um, or what the, they appear to look like, the, the brand. Blundstone. Blundstone, is that the name of these boots? I think that's, yeah, Blundstone. these blundstone boots just like this that I wore like every day even in the dead of, of summer They're not the kind of things you want to wear with shorts so I basically for a whole year 
did not even wear shorts. I just wore these boots everywhere. And I loved them. They're they were super comfortable. The only thing is, over time, I developed uh, what do you what's it called? Plantar fasciitis, which is like this super painful like. Um, um, thing with like the, the in the soles of my feet and around my toe and it made it just I couldn't couldn't wear these anymore I needed to wear more flexible uh, soles so but my pair of blundstone just sits there by the door every day just saying, hey, remember when you used to wear me every day? Not super happy with the way I've painted these shoes. Maybe I'll come back and add a little highlight here or there. I'll just do a little bit while I've got the same color mixed up here. Let's paint his clothes now. I'll come back to those boots and maybe later. So his clothes are going to be a really dark color. I'm just using this really dark color that I made f for kind of a lot of different purposes in the painting. This is just warm red and cold blue. Now this is about the darkest color that I can make on my painting. So, and I'm just because I'm going fast here, I'm just sort of I might be just eliminating all of the detail in his pants or folds. 
We'll see if I want to, I can also add black to the painting, which I haven't done anywhere thus far. jacket that could be done with some glazing perhaps so how about let's just do that I'm gonna get some glazing fluid on here let's mix it up with some of this darker paint on my brush wipe the brush off let's go to a smaller brush oops that's got paint still on it so I guess I gotta wash my brushes Ah, what am I doing? Let's put my finger down there to <laughs> into the right into the wet paint to steady my brush. Okay. Oh my goodness! I didn't just looking at the time. I'm like, I can't believe I've been working on this painting for so long. But there's really, you know, I knew and I, I, I said right off the bat this painting was going to take me at least four hours. And here I am at the five hour mark. I just modified this gray with adding a little bit more cold blue in there just to give it something a little bit different since I got all these kind of dark colors all right here so just looking like how can I make this different than everything else
Um, okay, I'm starting to get closer and closer here. <laughs> it's always a dangerous thing when I say that. Um, <laughs> Paul says, don't worry, we don't have to take the bus home. That's true. Um, let me see. I'm going to blow dry this. Let's just zoom back out. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to outline the jacket with a glaze. Just a little bit more opaque. So here's kind of roughly where this, let's put the pocket here. Will I put the frog in there? I don't know.
just gonna get uh, this hand a bit here. darker side, okay? That's a little too yellow. Painting wet paint just is a recipe for frustration. So let's move on to it's putting like a white tip at the end of this umbrella, even though the original obviously is black. I'm just, uh, I gotta deviate a little bit anyway, so, or I have deviated a little bit.
Okay. Paula says, thanks for your wife's support. Good job, Michael. Well, we'll see how, <laughs> how my wife feels when uh, when I see her. I think she's already headed off to bed, so. I might be sleeping on the couch tonight. umbrella
but yes, I do have a very supportive wife. I, I, I agree. <laughs> very understanding woman. not in the original but you know once you've sort of started to deviate from the original you just got to keep on going Let's just zoom back out and just see how we're doing. Okay. Let me see a few things. I'm just going to fix this boot a bit. Take a bit of this cool yellow and white. Oh, 
Be careful about using a painting rag that's got wet paint on it to wipe away paint. Ay, 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 what was I thinking? So one thing I just did when I was zoomed out, and the reason why I got paint everywhere, is I was just thinning her cheek out there. It was a little bit wide, and then I also added um, a bit of the other side of her uh, shoulder there, which hadn't been there before. And because that wasn't there, it made her whole body look really, her neck look very, very long. In fact, Just a tiny little, you know, microscopic amounts of paint make a huge difference.
some little white dots in these eyes. <laughs> this is the kind of stuff that feels like some kind of brain surgery here where I'm trying to basically use the smallest tiny tip of paint. The same sort of thing in the in this guy's eyes here. got some of this little bit of a gray Bit darker as we go around. Not quite that dark. Let's do the bony fingers here.
bunked that up, hey? So I think I'll outline that with a uh, pen here. And then... Shamza checks in again. <laughs> I'm surprised you've been working on this painting for this long. It looks amazing. Well, uh, yeah, maybe it looks amazing. It's not not my the. It's yeah, it's it's okay, I guess. Um, a little frustrated with some of the with what's some of what's transpired, but. So I'm going to use a um, one of these Posca pens, the Uni Posca pen, and it's an acrylic pen. You can see the size of this one. It's 0 0.7 millimeters, and I like there's this. I did do use this black one earlier for some of the face, uh, and I sort of decided it was a little bit. Uh, it's this is the, supposed to be the same size. I thought it was a little bit thinner. Um, so they both say zero point seven. Um, oh, this is bullet shaped, and this is pin typed. This one's obviously much finer. Oops. Ah. Than the uh, than this one I'm using. So I'm going to use this to do a little bit of outlining around all of the boa on the f on here. So to start with this, I think I might work my way from top. Actually, you no. Know, before I do anything here, I'm going to blow dry this because it's all still left. So while this is going on, very, you know, this is a gray. I can use, I have black, obviously, but um, I'd rather start with gray and do these and just see how it looks so that my outline is very subtle first 
rather than go right into black. And I, even if I did black, I probably wouldn't want to use black everywhere. I think this is going to be f really good just as with the gray. And it, it's definitely cleaning up what I felt was kind of like a messy part of the painting. As outlining often does. So this is a, a major time saver. Cons like if I was trying to do all of this with my brush, oh my goodness, I've been on working on this painting forever already. That would add even more time onto the clock. I almost dipped the pen into the palette to get more paint on it. I'm so used to dipping my brush into the palette. Though I will say there is a aspect of using this type of a tool that 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 looks like I've drawn it with a pen. It doesn't have like the the hallmarks of a brush in that a brush you can see it you know varies width. Now Posca does make one of these that does have a, a brush tip. Um, okay, let's let that dry. Let's do I want to use for a few minutes before I go right into that. Just
Oops. So I just did a little bit of outlining on this side here. I don't know, what's dangerous about this is I start thinking about outlining everything. And it's going to really change this painting if I do that. For a second let's back out like I mean that just saved me a couple of hours <laughs> like fiddling in there with those details um, I think I want to just tackle this tree momentarily just kind of get away from the pen Just wanting to clean up some of these edges on the tree a bit. Can't remember what, what my longest episode was. I think it was my uh, Chi by Chi when we did the 12 landscape screens, the famous Chinese artist. Also, the, the best-selling Chinese artist, or, or the, at least he, the, his paintings have the hold the current auction record for the most expensive artwork ever sold by a Chinese artist. But in that, paint, in that episode, we painted essentially 12 paintings in six hours. Here, I'm still working on the first one. <laughs> and getting close.
a look. Man, it's getting, I'm getting to the point where now it's very minor details. I think I might glaze and just darken a little bit in here. And so make a, a, like a dark purple glaze. Try to simulate some of the layering of
think I'm gonna get. Let's, I'm gonna mix up in a little bit more darker color. I think this might be. We're getting right near the end here. Probably 20 more minutes at the most, and I'll be done. Oh, what a marathon! So, you know, this kind of thing takes time. But it does um, make a difference. So I'm glazing with this, um, you know, doing very thin layer so that I can both outline and blend at the same time, just to save a little bit more time. And you know, I also don't want these outlines to be too dark, I mean they're pretty dark as it is, right? So I could have just walked away with these outlines done with the Posca marker and I could outline it with black with the Posca marker. But I just feel like that's gonna be too dark. If I put black, you can see how dark the black is. And it just looks, it's just gonna make everything sit right on the top. And suddenly, this would become the very, very first thing anyone would look at. And it's not really my favorite part of the painting. So, you have to be really careful about black and where you put it in your painting. So, let's... Okay. 
continue here. Oops, sorry. So, you know, does this defeat the purpose of having gone over those outlines with the Posca marker? I don't think so. I actually think it's possible that the Posca marker, uh, the acrylic pen, might have actually made my life a little bit easier because now I've got like, I'm sort of going over its lines. And those lines may have been. It might have helped to have put them there because it's sort of like they've created little roads for uh, my paintbrush to glide over top of. So, because th th these marks I'm putting on right now are going on really nice and easy. And I just have a feeling that the, it's because the Posca marker has kind of established a, a nice smooth pathway for these brush strokes to travel on top of. I mean, that's definitely making a huge difference. It de definitely is improving this area of the painting that... And you know, it's just one of those things where when you start working on a painting and you, you cross over a certain length of time working on it and you're just like well you know what if I've invested this amount of time on it what's what's another couple of hours <laughs> oh goodness it's a little bit crazy making but and it's funny because I was just <laughs> lecturing my students in school about like um, managing your time efficiently. I'm sure one of them is going to be a smart ass and will, will tell me next time in class like, hey, I was watching your six hour live stream the other day and um, so you know how you Give us a hard time about spending too long on things. So, uh, what's up with... <laughs> um... But, uh... It's, it's interesting, like, this is... I'm just doing this purely for love, right? <laughs> um, and... This is one of my favorite paintings of all time. I'm excited to... I'll probably put it in a frame in the living room, and... So, if, it's, if I'm going to look at it for a long time... Then you know, might as well just take take my time on it and make it look good, right? <laughs> okay. So I'm just gonna take this color, a little bit of this glazing fluid.
it a little bit more. Little shadows as, as these bows kind of disappear into the center of the of the boa. And it's this kind of layering and the shadows which I think the this thing has so far lacked that now it's starting to gain and that gives it some depth and weight Lolly says, your commitment and attention to detail is on another level. I'm not sure I could sit and do all this in one take like you have. It's super impressive. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, I don't know if it's to be admired or pitied that uh, that I'm still going on here. There's a bit of foolhardiness to almost every artistic endeavor. I got a swell. It's looking good, I guess. In an ideal world, I'd be using more of the same color to do this, or, or the, of the color that it originally was, rather than using one color to darken all of them. One color to darken them all. In a world where there was only one color to darken every feather on the boa, there was one man.
I think it looks better when I zoom out, so we'll just take... i just uh, almost done this part, and I think I'm probably done for the day. I mean, there's a part of me that wants to now maybe put a few little black outlines on here, but I think I'll have to restrain myself from doing so. Oh, I should do a little bit of glazing underneath their feet just to give them to locate them on the ground here so they're not just floating through space <laughs> Lolly says I went to bed here in the U United Kingdom in England with you starting this painting and woke up to you finishing it all worth it in the end though when you can feel proud of something thank you <laughs> <laughs> that's nuts that's crazy oh my goodness okay so let's just take I mean this uh, this brushes needs to be cleaned that one needs to be cleaned too let's get a, a cleaner clean brush to do a final glaze Right, so just something we'll start out with a, a very kind of subtle glaze and then we'll just kind of build towards here so most of the light seems to be kind of hitting from the top down so That's very subtle. So I'm gonna, let's uh, I'm gonna just get it a bit. I think, let's get, uh, warm blue in here too. So I should blow dry this here.
right, so starting to kind of settle them on the ground. That's pretty good. I'm just gonna darken also these shoes. So I just kind of glazed right over top of them. Well, good thing first thing in the morning I've got a massage scheduled. So, after standing all evening doing this, that'll be welcome.
that good enough? Can I walk away? Lolly says, do, are you ever daunted by certain pieces, or do you happily dive into any project with confidence? Is there any piece you remember that you dreaded or had a really tough time doing? Um, I think every piece I do is a little bit stressful. There's always a little bit of, um, of fear that comes with making any art, I think. Um... So, I'm just doing this yin and yang symbol. Um, hmm. I'm a, a, a bit foolhardy <laughs> at times. Like to spend all day doing something like this is a little bit silly, but I also it brings me a lot of joy. I think it's 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 like any anything. If you've been doing something for a while, like painting, I've been doing for over twenty years. It's less. I guess there's a fear for sure. Um, but I also know that the stakes are really low. Like, what is the worst possible thing that could happen right now? Worst possible thing that could happen is this doesn't turn out to my satisfaction, and I've so-called wasted seven hours of my t my life. Um, but I, I again, I don't think of it as wasting time, and I'm also pretty confident after being painting for so long that. I should be able to pull it off eventually if I stick with it long enough. Um, so sometimes I procrastinate because I know it's going to be a little bit difficult or take a lot of time and it's like uh I really want to, but the satisfaction that comes from doing something like this is, <laughs> this could be a, a blessing or a curse because you're like, ah, oh, wow, look at that, I can do that. Well, what else can I do? Um... <laughs> Lolly says, you'll be seeing feather boas in your dreams tonight. Yes. Paul says, move both your arms up and down until you feel your shoulders get relaxed. Yes, I will be... Uh, as soon as I'm done here, I will be doing some stretches. <laughs> I think I'm good enough to walk away from this one. I feel happy enough. I just want to check the actual title of this piece. I thought it was a little bit longer. Yeah, Dream of a Sunday After. Does that, what did I title this here? Yes, I knew I mistitled it a little bit.
time this took me from. <laughs> Let's put from 4 p.m. to. So just like it took him a year to get it done, it took me almost as long to do my version. <laughs> okay, that feels good. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, of course, again, like any painting I've done, there's always little things that... Um, I could do more of uh, likenesses aren't quite exactly there, but what are you gonna do, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, everyone. If you enjoyed today's episode, I know this was one of the longest live streams I think I've ever. It's definitely the longest live stream I've ever done, and probably one of the longest uh, in anyone's done. So thank you so much for tuning in, watching for even a little bit. I appreciate your support. If you're interested in uh, supporting the channel, there's the PayPal link below. If you want to send a um, check or e-transfer, contact me through the Facebook group or my website. My email's on there. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow. We're going to paint the brown lady, the, the most famous photo of a ghost, real or hoax. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy your evening. Have a wonderful sleep or breakfast, wherever you might happen to be. Come on. There we go. Good night, everybody. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Good night.